Hi, everyone. So I'm Fu Chu Tang from Peking University. So this session uh, will be chaired by me and Professor Christine Wells. And the topic of our session is uh, developmental biology. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Christine Wells. And she is a professor of the University of uh, Melbourne. So I think I leave the time for uh, Christine. So Christine, would you please share your slides? Can you see those okay? Perfect, yeah, please. All right, well, welcome to the development session uh, for the Human Cell Atlas Asia. Um, I'm very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity to um, share my research with you and, and join some fantastic speakers in this session. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work that I've been doing for the last 10 years in uh, the stem cell community, uh, developing transcriptomic atlases to help stem cell researchers understand the molecular phenotypes of the data that they've been exploring in a dish. And the tagline for the Stemphomatics platform for the last 10 years has been, read the papers, see the data, where we um, help uh, people who are not bioinformatics experts explore um, curated data from the major studies in the stem cell field. When I say curated, I mean that we go through a very strict process of reviewing um, the quality of the data, both from the experimental perspective, but also from the perspective of the data quality itself. And about 30% of the data sets that we bring in from the public domain fail these QC metrics. Why do they fail? There are a lot of um, experimental design flaws, uh, particularly when you're working with small data sets that I think are important to, um, to emphasize even to the single cell community because they are experimental flaws that propagate across platforms. And this is where um, an assay is run on a very small number of replicates. So it's very difficult to do proper statistical modeling or where batch and biology are confounded so that you can't deconvolute variants from the way a sample was measured. Um, and that interferes with understanding uh, what is being measured. And unfortunately, a lot of the normalization strategies that we have available to us can, can compound this problem, it, particularly if it's a supervised normalization approach where you assign samples to a different batch or a different sample class, you can either enhance uh, and exaggerate differences between those groups, or you can emphasize the similarities. You need to be really aware of the um, the statistical structure of your data before you move forward. The other area that we have found played in the stem cell research area is the use of small numbers of marker genes as evidence that the cells that people are using are a stem cell or are a differentiated cell type. And it's this question, how similar is a stem cell to the cells of our body that I want to explore with you today? So our approach to uh, a lot of the small end data problems um, is very simple. We can recognize that for those samples that do make it through our QC pipeline, they may have a lot of valuable experimental information, but the, um, the, the observations are ad hoc in an individual experiment. And it, there needs to be some scale, scale at an atlas level to be able to see that a pattern is generalizable and that generalizable pattern may then form a rule. And an example of this may be a set of genes which are um, typically observed as markers in vivo and just asking whether or not they also specify cell type when the cells are derived in a dish. So we um, have developed methods for aggregating a lot of data together. We call these ensemble atlases and um, they're a little bit like a tapestry. Any individual thread 
It's hard to see the overall picture, but when all of the threads are brought together, uh, the emerging properties of the system that you're interested uh, develop. So I'm going to tell you two quick stories, one about pluripotent stem cells and the other about blood cells. And the question that I wanted to ask around um, the pluripotent stem cells has really been driven by um, Martin Perra, a colleague at the Jackson Laboratories in the USA, who worked closely with one of my students, Lizzie Mason, uh, who's now um, uh, taking on a, a postdoc in another laboratory. And this is a study that came out earlier this year. So the, the essential question that we're addressing here is what are the properties of pluripotent stem cells? And in particular, how similar are they to the cells that we um, see in very earlier embryogenesis? Now, the punchline from this story is that stem cells are useful, um, but they are still a culture artifact. The um, embryonic stem cells are taken from a blastocyst in culture, but this is a very transient um, stage in human embryonic development and propagation of the intercell mass as cells in culture is quite artificial. We can also derive stem cells now by reprogramming a, a mature cell back to um, behave like this early embryo. And it's very difficult to distinguish between an embryonic derived stem cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell. They share very similar properties in the dish. So the question here is how equivalent are the stem cells that we have in a dish to the early embryo? And many people have been tr trying to tackle this question. Now I'm showing you a really lovely cartoon from Janet Rossent and Patrick Tam, um, illustrating the key points in human development before the embryo implants into the womb. And the stages that the uh, embryonic stem cells are um, uh, taken are pre-implantation uh, at this point of the early blastocyst. But of course, as they go through a culture process, they start, they continue to mature developmentally as well. So there's some disagreement about whether these are cells that sit within an early or late epiblast, for example. Now, my colleague Martin has for a long time been asking what are the properties of pluripotent stem cells, and he had noted that colonies of pluripotent stem cells grown in a dish have regional properties, regional heterogeneity. And in particular, you can see with fluorescent staining of this stem cell marker, GCMT2, uh, that you have high levels of staining on the edge of the colony and the middle of the colony can be, can lack staining altogether. And he has a um, flow cytometry panel that he's used to sort the cells from these colonies and he can see that cells which are very high in GCTM2 and other markers such as CD9 and EPCAM are also the cells that have very high proliferative potential. What I mean by that is that taking these uh, colonies, sorting them on GCTM2 and other markers such as CD9 allows you to isolate the cells that are sitting in these different zones of a colony. And what you can see is that there are clearly um, some cells which are highly proliferative and some cells which are not, depending um, as indicated by this EDU incorporation, that the cells with very low markers that sit in the middle of the colony have low proliferative potential and the cells that are sitting on the outside of the colony have very high proliferative potential as measured by DNA content and EDU incorporation into that um, colony. So um, Martin and Lizzie painstakingly picked individual cells across these colonies and ran single cell qPCR using fluidine. So this is really old school technology. And what we observed was that um, as you looked at very high levels of protein expression 
you can also see very high levels of RNA expression. So I'll just remind you that because this is a PCR-based analysis, a high CT level means that the product is not detected. And so we're looking for CT values that are sitting down here to be called present. So in this instance, we have two populations of cells, a large population which is not expressing CD9 and a small population that is. And so as you move down this um, hierarchy of high levels of GCTM2 and CD9 expression, you can also see a gain of increased variability in CD9 RNA as well. So how equivalent are these stem cells to the early embryo? Remembering that we're looking for the differentiated cells in the middle of the colony and the highly proliferated cells on the outside. Are there any differences in how these map to these early stages of the human embryo? This is a really busy slide and I apologize for that in advance. But what I'm showing you here are sets of genes which in monkey, single cell monkey embryo data generated by Frederick Lanner, you can see that the inner cell mass has very high expression of inner cell mass genes as that monkey embryo transitions to the early epiblast, you see gain of the epiblast genes. As you move through to late stage epiblast, you see loss of the inner cell mass and gain of the signature genes for the, the late stage epiblast and so on. What I'm showing you here are um, the high, medium, low and negative fractions across our colonies for a number of cell lines under a number of different culture conditions. And what, what you can see here is that across all of these culture conditions, markers across all of these embryonic stages are clearly detectable. So the stem cells are not hitting uh, markers exclusively of the early inner cell mass, nor are they hitting markers exclusively of the late epiblast or, and gastrulating stage. To show you that in more detail, just for two sets of genes, here are genes which are in the monkey embryo, high in the early um, epiblast and starting to be lost as you move through into that gastrulating embryo. And you can see too that they are also high in our highly proliferative cells and lost as those cells move to the middle of the colony. And that this is a pattern that's pretty consistent across all of the culture conditions and cell lines. But if you also take this gastrulating um, signature here, which are high only in the monkey gastrulating embryo stages, you can see that they are still quite reliably expressed across the proliferative and non-proliferative cells, but there is a gain of expression in the single cells isolated from the middle of the colony compared to the, the end of the colony. So this tells us when we look at um, Martin's single cell data on top of all of the other pluripotency data that we have in Stemphomatics, that we have this, um, this apex of highly proliferative cells out of which a whole lot of differentiation trajectories can be seen within a dish, um, sometimes even within the same dish. But these cells are nevertheless not equivalent to the early monkey embryo at all. And they are influenced by culture, as you can see across the different colours banded on this um, PCA. And they're certainly quite different to pluripotent stem cells, which are cultured under naive conditions. So culture conditions have a major impact on pluripotent cell phenotypes. That doesn't mean that a pluripotent cell can't give rise to really useful tissues, human tissues, for study in regenerative medicine, and of course, to help us understand the developmental processes in our own bodies. These are cells that really do um, uh, take on many of the phenotypic attributes of the tissues that we're interested in. So, what about the stem cell derived 
um, material, how equivalent is it to the tissue that we see in, in vivo? And so I'm going to switch now from the pluripotent cell group to the blood cell part of our atlas. And here I'm showing you um, some work that was generated in, in my laboratory. So the myeloid atlas that we have in Stemphomatics is it consists of about 900 samples across a range of human primary macrophages, um, progenitor cells and dendritic cells. But we also include models of myeloid um, cell development and culture, including blood cells which have been differentiated to dendritic cells or to macrophages. Um, so we can see here um, if they've been coloured in dark green as in vivo, that means that they've been profiled directly from the tissue. Ex vivo means they've been um, sampled after some period in culture. And in vitro means they've been entirely derived um, in, in vitro, that is, they're from a pluripotent stem cell. So this culture phenotype that we observed, even for pluripotent stem cells, we can see for primary cells as well. And for those of you who work with myeloid biology, this will not surprise you. But if you, if you compare all of the samples of monocytes taken from peripheral blood to monocytes that have been cultured for any period of time, you can see a very clear separation in their behavior. And many of the genes that separate these two groups are genes that are involved in the rolling of monocytes along a blood vessel and their extra vision into tissue. So we think that culture exposing a monocyte to plastic tricks it into thinking that it's starting to move into that tissue environment. Similarly, if we have a look at dendritic cells which have been cultured, they sit apart from de dendritic cells which are derived from tissue. And de dendritic cells which are entirely differentiated in, in a dish, either from cord blood progenitors, such as CD34 progenitors, or from monocytes, really don't behave like the in vitro, uh, the in vivo cells at all. Uh, in fact, the monocyte derived DCs just look like cultured monocytes. Here I'm showing you some um, single cell data taken from two different groups. Um, a very early 2017 study from um, uh, Aviv's lab, Villani, uh, and a more recent study here from uh, Florent Giraud. And here you can see that these dendritic cells line up with the primary dendritic cells that we have in the atlas very, very clearly. But we can also see that for some classes of DC, there's a, um, a great deal of overlap between monocytes in the atlas as well. And the in vitro derived DCs really don't look like um, any of the primary cells, regardless of how they're measured. So the iPS derived macrophages also sh um, show an abnormal phenotype. When we look at all of the iPS derived macrophages in the atlas, we can see that they have retained ectopic expression of some matrix proteins. This is very atypical for a primary human macrophage, although there are some circumstances where you might expect to see some matrix formation. In general, this is not a common phenomenon. And we were able to validate that indeed these cells do express not only at an RNA level, Christine. but also at a protein level. Christine. One more minute, finish? please. Thank yeah. you. So this is my summary slide, and it's to say, uh, to remind you what are the properties of pluripotent stem cells. Um, the first is to say that culture is a really um, profound environment for any cell to be in. And so regardless of whether you're taking a primary cell out of the body or you're differentiating a cell from a pluripotent stem cell, it's not going to be equivalent because cells adapt to their environment. I think this is easy for us to see in the context of an atlas like this because we're not trying to harmonize the variation and force the in vitro cell to look like the in vivo cell. And that's a mistake that many of the individual experiments try to do. 
So I just want to finish by thanking the people whose work I've referred to here, in particular Martin Perra and Lizzie, who um, uh, did the single cell work on the pluripotent stem cells, Kim Ann Lacow, Paul Angel, um, Johnny Choi, and Nadia Raja. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, great talk, Christine. So here is there's a question from uh, Ren. I think his question is, did you also look at uh, label retention in the ESCs with high stem cell markers versus with uh, middle or low um, markers? Uh, yes, so um, when you say label retention, um, do you mean retention of the um, embryonic signature genes? What we could see is that they, they express highly the embryonic signature genes from early stages. So they look like um, inner cell mass, mm -hmm. um, but they also look like epiblast and they also have features of the gastrulating embryo. And it didn't matter whether we looked at the highly proliferative or, or the low proliferating cells. Mm -hmm. So these are cells that have um, attributes of an early embryo, but they are not equivalent to an early embryo. And he also asked, uh, did you assess this phenomenon in ESL cells growing in 2i medium? No, that hasn't been done in this study, but we are looking at it in other studies. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I can tell you that the 2i medium is al also has a lot of heterogeneity uh, involved in those stem cell phenotypes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christian, I have a question. So when you uh, see this difference between the in vitro culture ESL, and the in vivo embryo. So you think this um, difference is just, uh, how to say, don't make a lot of difference for the functional side of the cell, or maybe it's quite artificial, just uh, make the cells, how to say, um, have quite different biological uh, features. What Martin has shown in that paper is that the highly proliferative cells are more efficient at making extra embryonic tissue like trophoblasts. And I think that's very important because that positions those cells very early in that embryo life. But not all, uh, it's not very efficient. So not all of those highly proliferative cells are capable of forming um, trophectoderm. So um, what I think happens is that there is some memory of the stage they were at in the, in the embryo but then they acquire additional characteristics depending on the environment that they're in. So the 2i environment, for example, forces them into a very different state to the primed or formative ES cells that Martin is looking at. Okay. So I think Ram have another question asking about the difference between the slow cycling cell and the fast cycling one. The slow cycling cell sits in the middle of the colony mm -hmm. and the fast cycling cell sits on the outside of the colony. So the colonies expand from the edge. Mm -hmm. And as the cells start forming those interactions between them, they're more likely to start that differentiation process. Mm -hmm. they, they start to acquire priming marks in their epigenome. Uh, so this, this, this regional um, difference can be um, lessened by the type of culture that you keep them in and certainly keeping small colonies, for example, but it can't be removed. Okay, so with no, I think, yeah, I think Franzi have another question. So he asked, if naive stem cells are not embryo-like, then what are they? And what can they teach us? So I think that they are really remarkable um, pluripotent cells that have the capacity to take instruction and move into different cell states. What can they teach us? Um, I think very excitingly, they can teach us something about the regulation of functions, pathways and networks outside of that developmental context. So we are working so hard towards copying exactly the tissue that we want in the body we forget to learn something about these ectopic programs, which are um, maybe in one sense, um, evidence that the cells aren't what we want them to be, but in another sense, evidence that these are functions that are extremely robust 
uh, extremely um, uh, modular. And they tell us something about the evolution of that group of genes as a whole and not just within the context of development. So I think there's a lot more we could do with this data if we take a step away from comparing it to the embryo. Okay, so with uh, no more questions, let's thanks uh, Christy for her excellent talk.